Do you remember yes, the sir. one that you guys played like very early in the morning? I think it was like a 5 a.m. thing. It was a 24-hour festival in Sao Paulo. Mm -hmm. I was there. Yes, sir. Yeah, oh, man. Wow. yeah, man. Our Taylor and oh, I we were talking about goodness. like, oh, I'm going to share there with honey. What got my attention when, uh, because I'm, I'm going to tell this story later, but uh, I actually knew Catch a Fire before coming to New Zealand. A good friend oh, who yeah. was here, he, he told me, there's this uh, big, I was actually about to ask you, did you make it to Brazil when Catch a Fire played there? Yeah, yes, yes, yes twice. Great. Twice, yes, sir. Do you remember yes, the sir. one that you guys played like very early in the morning? I think it was like a 5 a.m. thing. It was a 24-hour festival in Sao Paulo. Mm -hmm. I was there. Yes, sir. Yeah, oh, man. wow. Yeah, man. Our Taylor and oh, I were talking about goodness. like, oh, I'm going to share there with honey. That was madness, bro, yeah. because that's one of the most beautiful festivals in Brazil. It's in Sao Paulo. And what they do, they put a lot of stages around uh, the city. I would say more than a hundred, probably like in very different like locations, but the center is where things are happening, obviously, but it's a 20 million people uh, oh, state, you know, like, so 12 Ooh, only in the city. So we went in the evening and then my friends from here, my Brazilian mm -hmm. friends from mm -hmm. Auckland mm -hmm. text Taylor mm -hmm. and I, and he's like, you know that Catch a Fire is playing mm -hmm. at the festival. Like, and we're like, oh, oh yeah, what time? And then he's like, I think it's 5 a.m. Mm. <laughs> and we're like, whoa, okay. So we might as well go get some rest and come back. So like we caught the the the, the subway at 4.30 wow. to go see Catch a Fire. And it was a beautiful one because mm. uh, it was some bang to a Taylor uh, behind this beautiful old school church that you would mm. not expect to, to see a gig there. And man, and Catch a Fire is going hard at 5.30 a.m. Mm, and then everybody's mm. like, oh. <laughs> So I was like, yeah. Anyway, so that's that's my story, man. Thanks for, for yeah, doing yeah, that. Yeah, it, yeah, it, it, it. And then, of course, since I came to New Zealand, it's, it's the bands that I've seen the most live. Mm. Yeah, I love mm. it. So thank you. Um, mm. But what got my attention was uh, the harmonies. Mm. The singing. And then I come mm. to New Zealand and I start to listen to Sons of Zion and then like all these other you know, different ways, but like really focusing on, on the vocals. Mm -hmm. Is it something that Catch a Fire always felt like and, 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 and started doing or, or came from, from earlier that, can you take me through that part? Because for me, it was always so powerful. Oh, so man. So many voices on stage and I was like, whoa, whoa. So, yeah. Yeah, well. I just poked my heart out there. Thank you for that, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, I remember that time, and um, I remember that time we flew down from north, um, straight after a gig up in north, um, um, down to Sao Paulo, and um, played that gig, and yeah, was uh, a little sleep, but um, happy to be there, and to be in, 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 in the city there, and see, the, see and feel the culture, seen a lot of cool looking people over there, man, they, wow. I think they all had big hair and they, a lot of cool styles in Brazil. And, and um, like the band in front of us were just playing. Man, monster musos, monster mm. musos. Was it the blind band, eh? the Brazilian Oh, yeah. Tribu de Ja Tribu played de before yeah. you guys. <sighs> all blind. Oh, maybe <laughs> six of them are blind. <laughs> and two, yeah, man, tri that's mm. right. Tribu Jija open for you guys. Next Six guide dogs you have to feed and tame. Oof. <laughs> That's a tricky gig. Mm. Well, one thing I noticed though is that, um, like in in Brazil, and we've played a few times at early early hours. Uh, is that is the drinking culture? I, I, I don't know, but um, what I saw is a lot of composure. Everyone composed like over here in New Zealand in early hours in the morning, man. Everyone's just crazy, but over mm. there, man, everyone was so chill around the, the early hours. And that's a good topic, honey, because we say that to our friends around here because mm -hmm. they don't understand because we don't get drunk as you guys get here because yeah, it is not safe mm. safe mm. to get drunk there. You know, like we well, have this expression yeah. that is like a little bit dodgy, but mm -hmm. we say that the ass of a drunk person has no honor in Brazil. Oh. Oh. So you got it, so, you, so you know, right? So it's true, it's a saying actually. Yeah. You need really? to be aware, you need to be aware, you know. Oh, <laughs> far out. 
<laughs> yeah, man, that's but, so chill over in yeah. Brazil. Yeah, drinking. And 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 it's something that when I came to New Zealand, it <laughs> mm. took me time to understand yeah. if it was actually better or worse. Because in Brazil, you can drink anywhere. Like you can drink in the streets. You can drink in mm. public transports. And when I came to New Zealand, mm. it was like, oh, this is actually cool. You cannot drink in the streets. And then as years went by, and I realized how big of an issue is the drinking thing in the country. Mm. And I went back to Brazil. I realized actually, I think it's better if you mm. can, because then people are more relaxed. You know, yeah. like you're not. Oh, I cannot do it here. Mm. Oh, they're gonna. Oh, or yeah. oh, you hide. You know. And then interesting eh, how it depends mm. on where you are. Your yeah. mind will will play with the circumstances. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, here we've got that hard culture. Eh? You know, drink go hard or go home kind of thing. Yeah. It definitely is rife here. Yeah. Um, as you said before about the big siblings, I'm the youngest of six, so I, I, I watched a bit of that and thought, now nah, I'll be more sensible. So I, I'm probably more Brazilian in terms of drinking myself. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> That's cool. But it's interesting to say that in terms of, I lived in Rarotonga for two years, my first teaching job at Te Reo College. Mm. And um, drinking there, it was so cheap to drink out in public. So you go out to the bars, the beach bars, $2 a drink, one fifty a drink. It's very easy to drink there. But you go to the supermarket and it's expensive. You know, you're buying a big imported thing course it was only later on i realized that <clears throat> the cheap drinks we got from the bar were the expired ones from australia and new zealand oh, sent yeah, out yeah, yeah. to the mm. cheaper people that could pay for them and there were some floaties yep there were definitely some floaties <laughs> <laughs> oh man that's crazy um yeah so um uh, back to the harmonies yes. oh yes sort of thing. Um, <laughs> I, I was going back there but i knew you would bring it back yeah 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 oh it'd be good to get one of the boys jamie or logan on the show man they'd give you the give you the run but i was fortunate to to um sing with those guys and jamie you know he's he's uh he knows all the harmonies and and logan knows what kind of harmonies that he wants to hear and that was i guess one thing that stood out in this band was the harmonies and i think that's a that's a natural thing for maori too singing growing up singing a kapahaka and I don't know, we just have that ear to, you know, if we hear a song, you know, someone tends to do the high and someone does the low. But I guess a lot of influence um, would be like from the Bob Marley songs, you hear the I3 singing, three wahine doing the, doing the BVs. Mm. Was there Rita? Was it was it his wife for a mm. while that, that mm. was part of the, the it was, eh? Was yeah, that right? yeah. I didn't mm. know that, it's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I love it. You're yeah, buzzing. Yeah. I can see you got this big yeah. smile oh, on your face. Yeah, because yeah. like reggae was not a thing that grew with me, but when I realized the power was like, oh, it's, it, it's, it says a lot. Yeah, and we we um, <clears throat> we loved the reggae music uh, when it came over in our oh, late 70s and 80s and seeing another genre within uh, New Zealand. I mean, you know, I was, I was young. I was, you know, school in school but um hearing something else and really affiliating um uh, to the uh to the lyrics apart from the you know the kickback song and seeing bob marley hey, he's a brown man oh what is what's he saying oh he's saying this he's saying against the system and uh, he's talking about babylon and he's talking about all these all these issues. Hey, we kind of can relate to that. And I guess that's where the um, I think for Maori Polynesians kind of you know kind of loved reggae music since then. Yeah. When you grew mm. up, um, honey, how was the relationship with um, like the educational system and 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 Maori culture? Because this is a topic that I love bringing to the show because we kind of like know the history of it but like each mm. experience is unique right yeah. um were you taught maori at school was your family speaking maori how how was that part of your upbringing yeah so my grandparents would be the first language uh say native speakers mm -hmm. uh first first language uh speakers uh, my parents not so much my the older sisters to my mum yes uh she was the youngest um and same on my on my dad's side you know they so the appearance you know hev heavily colonized and so that I wasn't really encouraged but they would speak together and uh say the odd word and 
phrases and we'd go down to the marae and and listen to the speeches and so little bits of pieces not formally um, taught uh, little culture songs in school uh, drips and drabs but I didn't know I didn't know any you know anything not as a subject like mm. was it was it like a subject like Maori as a as a as a subject um, is correct to say? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. correct words, yeah. Yeah, yeah. In certain schools, yes, not all schools. Like where, where I am, you know, is a uh, you know, high population of Māori, so it'll, it, it could be yeah, uh, bits and pieces, but not enough. And I didn't know that that, w that wasn't enough. Mm. You know, when you're small, when you're young, you just go to school and you just learn what you know, whatever they teach you. And not until, you know, you're a little bit older and, and you start thinking, it's like, oh, hang on. Oh, I should be, what, what happened there? What's my, how come I'm speaking, you know? Yeah, and and that really didn't happen until um, probably at the end of high school, mm. uh, kind of. Can, can I ask about that? Because I'd love to know at what point did you realise or, or finally understand that I actually have missed it? Or like, what, what was the moment? Was there a, some people you met where you thought, I, I can't connect with them as much as I'd like to? Or how did you realise that you wanted more? Oh, so well. how you came to that. Yeah, well, this was in primary school where, where I was attending a Rangiriri primary and we went down to Huntley and we watched the school. It was a bilingual school, Rako Mange, back then. And they stood up and they did all, they did this... Uh, uh, kapahaka, all these songs, and they did a lot, that, like this whole uh, drama, like of the gods. And I was thinking, oh, um, you know, I'm, that's when I thought, yeah, hey man, I'm missing something. I should be doing more instead of the couple of songs that mm. I know. Yeah, so yeah, so the curiosity grew there, and the um, uh, so my whole family, you know kind of a uh, kind of tight and we kind of grew all together and um, my mum as well uh, learning and teaching te reo Māori so we got that that way as well and so, so quite fortunate my father would do all the speeches down at the marae and he'll teach us karakia growing up so I was very very fortunate and but I understand that there was a whole lot you know thousands of uh, even yeah yeah, all around that didn't have that, that. so mm. I think I was fortunate even though I wasn't taught formally until I got a little bit curious in, in today and wanted to learn a little bit more and more and more so uh, I continued learning today you know all the way uh, through high school and then past high school and then you know through university as well and then in between. When did you go to university? Because if, if you had a, a bit of a career time, like wh when did university fit into your journey? And what were you, wh where were you? Waikato? Waikato? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was in, uh, yeah, I was living in Hamilton at the time. Uh, late, probably about 95, I started mm -hmm. at, at, at varsity there. So I was, I was learning um, te reo, of course. Mm -hmm. And... Um, yeah, and just, and Catch Fire came in, like, right at the end, actually. I, I, I graduated, I, I'd finished grad, graduating at, at university, and then and then was, uh, Catch Fire stuff was uh, getting a little bit busy. Oh, sweet, yeah, so busy, it yeah, worked perfect. out timing-wise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, did you know, because you, you're a, currently a teacher, did you think back then, you know, before Catch Fire got its traction, were you thinking maybe, uh, I'll be a teacher, I'll be able to give that experience, or was teaching never on the cards at that stage? Um, yeah, teaching was on the cards. I, I, was, I yeah. didn't have, yeah, I just followed suit in my, in my mum, with my mum, yeah. older brother, teaching family, and just just went casually along that teaching route. If, I, if anything, I'd go and teach te reo Māori. Was there a moment where your mum said, no, what are you doing with the band? No, you're going to be a teacher like me, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, 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 she was cool as... Um, yeah, yeah, so it 
so the band like fit in between ev- everything. I was jamming um, throughout university. I, it was other other people that I'd jam with. We'd all play, rec- you know, from f- some of my mates from Fiji, and um, yeah, yeah, just had a good time, and then just end up, you know, um, meeting uh, Catch Fire Boys and. Was when there, you, oh, oh, you sorry, man. No, no, you, was no, there you, another band that, like, so your, your, mate, your Fijian mates, was there a point where you're like, oh, maybe we'll do something here? Or was it always that it was jamming and Catch Fire was the first series? Or did you have like a lineup of several groups you already did music with and Catch a Fire took you along with them? Did they, did they steal you from another band? Um, yeah, um, no, not really. Um, yeah, I was on a few covers bands mm. in, in my life and, um, and then a few reggae bands, and we had a reggae um, Bob Marley uh, tribute band as well, That's and that, right. that that ended, that ended um, around about ninety ninety eight some sometime around there. I was living in um, May Streets. Um, we forty eight, so forty eight May, mm-hmm. forty eight May. Yeah. yeah, I was living on May Street there. Vegas Brown, mm. it's the Vegas Brown, Shout Kilda brother. Out. And um, and one of my mates came over and said, "Oh, I've heard these guys are starting up a band. Um, they're looking for a keyboardist." And I just got my uh, new uh, keyboard, and I was really keen to learn. The band had the previous band had split up, finished, and so I was like, "Yeah, man, I'm keen." Uh, can you can you tell us what it was? Oh, the key. Yeah, my keys. Uh, it's a Korg. Nice. Yeah, N two. Three, was it, was it a five? valve based amp? So you had a little valve sort of nah, blood in there? No, not now. those ones. No, I wish it was after after the T series, after the T series, the M series. Yeah. You have it's to M- know it. You have to ask. M two six four. That's cool. Like I, I've seen a couple of the videos, and I've seen because I think I've seen used Roland and Korg at different times. I was sort of looking yeah. at stage stuff, going, "What do they got? It's different things stacked up?" And I was, I was just curious to see what it was. The first one. That's quite big to go straight for Korg. That's a yeah, I like them. Yeah, They're yeah, nice. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I had to get my mum again to um, go guarantee on my um, the keys, and um, yeah, just really got into it and used it and tried to emulate as much as I can what I heard and what was going on. So there was no, yes, there was reggae going happening happening around New Zealand, you know, Auckland, Auckland, East Coast. But not really a movement. You weren't planning yeah. to bubble on the Korg. It wasn't your ambition to bubble. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Um, well, there was wasn't wasn't many people playing the keys, and and really around there. Oh, wow. around, yes, yeah, so I thought, oh man, I'll take, I'll, I'll, I'll play, I'll do that job. And it's it's an it's once you once you're playing the bubble, you, you're in a space where no one else is playing. Maybe the hit. Maybe yeah. the hat, but everyone like it's quiet, and you've got that one space that every single time to play in between. <laughs> kind of. Oh, if you're listening there. to audio platforms, get online <laughs> and watch the video. And I love the actions, the, oh, the my mime. It goodness. is, it is proven. Goodness, <laughs> it's feel, it's feel. You just watched to a North Bay show clip. If you want to watch the full show or if you want to see us live, subscribe to our YouTube channel and get notifications about our live streams. We do it three times per week, every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 7 p.m. And if you are more of a listener, go to altbase.nz to find out on which main podcast platforms we're on. Peace.